Yeah, I mean, driver for me, um, really, uh, at, you know, six, seven months ago, we were already working on other aspects of COVID response. Uh, there's a companion project on COVID testing. How do you scale up testing uh, ecosystem for COVID? Um, and what we realized is that as the pandemic progresses, uh, the requirements, the needs uh, are going to change. And so we thought that was probably uh, the right time to start thinking about vaccination planning, vaccination rollout, uh, because planning does take time. Uh, and we also knew that the kind of approach that we are developing will require a lot of data, uh, will require a lot of background analysis. So you can't turn it around in a day or two. Um, and, and given the background that we have is in operations and supply chain, uh, we thought that we are uh, well positioned to be able to generate evidence of this kind. As part of our research uh, uh, around COVID, uh, the primary focus that I've been uh, involved in is the vaccination campaign and uh, coming up with uh, what would be a cost effective vaccination uh, campaign design. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, given limited resources, limited vaccines available, what's the best way to use those uh, limited resources? And that's what the research uh, primarily focuses. And while we are both part of the research team, it involves a larger team consisting of epidemiologists and health economists so as to get a holistic perspective on this question. So uh, we think that the unique uh, aspect of our model is that it has uh, two broad components. So one is supply chain model. Um, so tracking how vaccines come all the way from the manufacturer to different parts of the cold chain, uh, storage, vaccine stores, all the way down to the session site. And uh, tracking this flow helps us to calculate the cost of delivering the vaccine to the point of administration and then administering the vaccine as well. But we are combining it with the other component, which is uh, what is called as transmission modeling. And that tries to calculate, quantify what will be the effect of vaccination on transmission, on new COVID cases, number of hospitalizations, number of deaths. So if you take uh, the term cost effectiveness, uh, which Ripad mentioned, cost will be calculated from the supply chain component and effectiveness will be calculated from this transmission model or the epidemiological model to then put together the overall picture. And the important thing to recognize is that there are dependencies. And what I mean by that is what your uh, supply chain for vaccines can support uh, affects uh, what can be done in terms of controlling the health outcome. Say, for example, you want to reduce mortality by a certain percentage compared to a scenario where you do nothing, then it requires certain actions to be taken in terms of providing for resources, planning for uh, supply of vaccines, planning for how these need to be administered. And so putting the two together helps us understand this the interdependencies better and therefore be able to come up with a more effective recommendation on what are different possible strategies that would work well. Thinking about strategies for vaccination, uh, let's start with the basic premise that um, the supply of vaccines is constrained, right? And so are many other uh, resources. So there is no way uh, but to think about a prioritization scheme. So we want to prioritize those individuals, those groups of individuals for whom the marginal value of uh, vaccination is the greatest. The one that we are uh, most interested in uh, analyzing using our modeling framework is uh, what we've been calling as uh, seroprevalence based strategies, right? So what do these do? Uh, they try to define a certain risk uh, index uh, for different uh, geographic regions, which can be either different states or within states, it can be different districts or within districts, it can be different pockets, urban versus rural. Uh, and this risk is really um, what is the risk of someone getting infected? Um, a way to measure that risk uh, would be to look at how many people already have developed antibodies for the virus. 
we can then start to prioritize those regions that have low seroprevalence, uh, which means that few people or fewer people in that region have antibodies, which means a larger fraction is at risk of getting an infection here onwards. Um, an extreme case of that would be to check the serostatus of every individual. And uh, we realize that in a limited resource country like India, this is uh, an ideal situation. We will never get to that place where every um, vaccination candidate is first tested for antibodies. So the strategy that we are proposing, you can imagine that as a pragmatic version uh, of that idealized strategy. And the vaccination strategy that Sarang defined is based on the health outcomes that it achieves. Now, to be able to implement that strategy, you need the vaccines to be delivered to those targeted geographic regions. So if we consider the example of prioritizing different geographic regions, then implementing a strategy would require delivering vaccines to the required uh, geographies. Now, an alternate to this question could be to say, okay, no, we want to actually finish vaccinating this geographic region because they're at the highest risk and therefore uh, they need to be vaccinated fast. When we determine what the resources required are, we can come up with estimates of, okay, how much is it going to cost? And when you put the cost together with the health outcome, you can come up with a cost effectiveness measure. To be able to model the health outcomes uh, of different vaccination strategies, we need to know what the transmission dynamics are. And the transmission dynamics depend on various parameters of the disease. So, for example, in some states, there might be seroprevalence data available at a district level and even further broken down within districts at an uh, for urban regions versus rural regions. Now, depending on the level at which the data is available, you can try and estimate what parameters of the disease transmission would lead to the outcomes that have actually been recorded. And so once you have that, you can say, okay, now if the disease were to occur again, then what would its outcomes look like? The other part of it is data related to the supply chain resources available. And our model, we are assuming that primarily we will depend on the resources available in the routine immunization program or the universal immunization program that uh, India has, which is very well developed, uh, reaches uh, vast parts of the country, even the remote locations, and therefore makes sense as a natural backbone on which to deliver the COVID vaccines. And then there is also structure of the model itself. So when we think about cold chain, what's the structure of the cold chain? How many tiers are there? How many cold chain points are there? So to come back to the question of heterogeneity um, across states, what we've done, because as Sripad said, we relied on the immunization program, uh, that structure is fairly uniform across states. So that allows us to build a model that can be very quickly adapted to different states. We don't have to start from scratch. Um, as the uh, thinking about COVID vaccine program in country evolved, uh, we uh, decided to approach different uh, stakeholders, different policymakers. Uh, we did present our work at the central level. Uh, and then based on their advice and their suggestions, we decided to also approach individual states, uh, sometimes approach the states directly, uh, sometimes approach the states through different uh, stakeholders, uh, which includes uh, technical support agencies, funding agencies who work very closely with the states and who we work with. So that creates a channel uh, for communication. Um, long story short, after a lot of effort, I think we are making progress with a couple of states. Um, in one state, we've been able to get very detailed cold chain data, uh, which was not publicly available, or we could verify whether the publicly available data was appropriate or not. Uh, for that state, we are also working now uh, closely with uh, some people who are designing the vaccination strategy for that state. And there is a there's an element of resistance, there's an element of skepticism because uh, models are models at the end of the day. Um, you know, they are based on data, but they're also based on assumptions. Uh, but how do you communicate this to yeah. policymakers that although you've not captured the entire reality into the model, uh, the key elements of the reality are there that help you to generate insights. Um, so it's been an ongoing uh, yeah. journey, I guess. Right. So for example, think about it from the perspective of a uh, district administrator 
who's in charge of implementing the vaccination in that district. Now, she is concerned with actually deciding, okay, where should I be doing the sessions? Uh, how many uh, nurses should I be planning for who will do the vaccination? How, many, how much cold storage equipment should I be planning for, budgeting for, etc. right? Now, what is required is to be able to speak the same language and be able to say, look, our model can help you get answers to these questions, right? Our model can help you estimate the number of nurses required, can help you estimate yeah. the amount of cold storage equipment that yeah. is necessary to do vaccination at a certain rate. And in some sense, that's, that's kind of how you start overcoming some of this resistance and start yeah. building a dialogue. Yeah, so essentially using the same modeling framework, but customizing the output to different right. uh, stakeholders, right. to, depending on what's most relevant to them. Right. Yeah. The outcome that everyone is seeking at the moment is, uh, you know, we are able to vaccinate most people in shortest amount of time and save maximum number of uh, lives, right? The strategies that we propose and evaluate using our model uh, appeal to policymakers, they're convinced, uh, and it has a real dent uh, mm -hmm. on the pandemic. Uh, resumption of economic activity as a result of uh, our recommendation of the model. That's really the uh, the pipe dream, if you will. Yeah. Right?